people. My name is Mike Lossman. I'm the technical product marketing manager at Forward Networks, but do not let marketing get in the way of anything with me. I've been in IT for 20 years. My career has spanned being a senior enterprise network architect for several companies to selling into companies to consulting for those companies in a big four consulting firm, now having been at Forward Networks. Uh, some fun facts about me. There was one point in time in my career where I did hold more than 35 active IT certifications. I have never seen any Star Wars movies, but I love space balls. <laughs> and I make a mean double chocolate chip and macadamia nut cookie. Matt, what about yourself? <laughs> That's going to be hard to follow, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm Matt Honea, the head of security and compliance at Forward. Um, Spent my whole career in security, um, worked for the U.S. government, worked as a researcher, and worked as multiple heads of security roles. So kind of seen it and practiced it as well. Uh, also doing a lot of macro research in the space when I worked in cyber insurance. So understanding kind of the macro view of what's happening in the world. So trying to bring a lot of unique perspectives. Um, very passionate about malware analysis. It was one of the first things that I did, looking at malware, taking apart malware, identifying malware, and everything related to that. Um, it's, it's only evolved. It's going to continue to evolve. Love to, to dive into that with you guys as well. Um, as far as outreach, you know, I, I like to write. Uh, it's just something that's, that's a passion to me. So I've got a, dozens of articles. I've got a couple white papers. I have a patent as well. Um, just trying to, to bring, give back to the community. Uh, security has given a lot to me, and I want to give back, back out for our, our next generation. Also a very, uh, you know, strong golf enthusiast. Love playing. Waiting on Mike's invitation out to Florida, I hear there's a lot of great courses out there. I'm primarily based on the West Coast in the U.S., so, you know, we've got good courses here, but, uh, but yeah. Can't you know, beat the ones that are in Florida. I hear there's some really nice ones out there. There are. <laughs> All right, so let's talk digital twins. So to kind of lay the foundation for uh, folks who may not know what Forward does, um, we use digital twins every day in our life from back in the day to i think you have something matt uh, an old school thing that we used to use you guys remember this this is i don't know if you can see this this is a map of lake tahoe um you can get lost going out there um mm -hmm. there's a lot of roads now nah, you know especially once you're off the highway trying to get to where you're going you look up an address trying to find the road on the map um I mean, it's great when you need it. The problem is how many maps do you need to keep with you? Imagine driving. Yeah, exactly. You're you're full of maps. You have an atlas trying to figure out where you need to go. It's it's very necessary. Everyone needs to know where they're going. Um, now, but now, fast forward a couple of years later, we have this digital twin that could be sitting in a map platform that's sitting on your phone that actually gets updated in real time versus having to go out and buy another stack of maps to keep in your map section inside of your cars. So, you know, Google Maps, Apple Maps are digital twins of the road. Why has this never happened in the network space, specifically the network space? Well, today we're going to talk about how we can get network data and turn it into security insights. So when Forward first started, Forward's big go-to-market was going around networking. Helping, you know, like helping like network engineers be able to troubleshoot multi-complex networks, uh, having them be able to use our search features like Google and be able to find stuff inside of their network. So it was mainly network focused. We had a lot of good conversations with some of our, our customers earlier on where they're saying, hey, you're collecting all this rich network data from us. There has to be some security data that we can get out of this and actually make it actionable for us to actually be able to go into our environments and see where we can improve our security posture. And that's the piece we're going to talk about today, how forwards, how a forward security suite can actually help organizations get to the next level with stuff. Exactly. And, you know, think about paper maps back in the day. It was one dimensional, you know, it's static. You had to update uh, when a new version came out, new roads were built. Um, everything has moved to digital. Everything's a digital replica now. It's hard to imagine going back to paper maps. Once you're locked into that digital replica on your phone, being able to see traffic updates, live updates, new roads, constant updates, you don't want to go back to that, that old strategy. And that's, I think, the value we're providing here 100%. is for your network. We know network changes very, very quickly. And being able to stay up to date, sure, Visio diagrams used to work back in the day, but everyone is looking for something that's more robust, changing with a very dynamic environment, especially with cloud. 
things come up and down in seconds. Uh, so being able to understand that routes is those routes are really important. So very good segue. So not only are we talking about security insights for on-prem devices, we're talking about security insights for stuff that live in AWS, Azure, and GCP also. So looking at this next slide, seeing how we you know broke out the use cases, how many of these use cases can you put into their own application? A few of them, right? You know, yeah. we had vulnerability management, incident response, path verification, troubleshooting, change control, inventory management, all that can be its own application. Yeah. Whereas at Forward, what we do with all the rich data that we get, we can then take that and take those horizontal use cases and those vertical use cases and present it to you in one single platform. Yeah, and and Mike, so it's just so hard to find a tool that works across these stacks, mm -hmm. a, a single tool, right? Everyone in in NetOps, NetInch has their own tools that they love. Everyone in cloud has their own tools that they love. And everyone in network security has their own tools that they love. And you know, you you basically pay seat licenses. You know, ten users here, twenty users here, hundred users here, whatever it might be. The platform that we've built essentially unifies this. Anyone, we you know, we don't have the C license model, but anyone from any of the teams can access this and get the same data that they need applicable to their vertical. Mm -hmm. And that's really powerful. That's not something that exists commonly in today's environments. And the one thing I'll add on to that is you don't need to be an expert in that specific area to be able to understand the data that comes out of the platform. So for instance, if you're looking at stuff in the cloud, you don't need to be an AWS guru or an Azure guru. It's laid out in such a way that, you know, anyone can look at it and go, oh, okay, the packet is going from here to here to here to here to here. And I could visually see that rather than having to log into an AWS console and kind of fish my way through it. Yeah. And I know we've got some really exciting demos here, so mm -hmm. we shouldn't spoil it too much with words. I think our visual representation and our live demos will really speak to that ease of use yes. and applicability. I mean, it looks very similar to some other uh, solutions that I've seen recently, uh, you know, in terms of just the network visualization and then being able to layer on security on top of that. So I'm really interested in seeing kind of, you know, some of the unique elements from the uh, forward networks uh, approach to things. So I mean, what? seeing all those use cases co covered off is uh, pretty neat. Just looking at the screenshots, I'm, I'm eager to see where you guys are going with it. So. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm real excited about you mentioned asset management and my ears started to melt and I'm like, Ooh, okay. I need, I need more information about that. All right. <laughs> great. Great. Yeah. So hopefully we'll get into those in detail. And I think the data that we're collecting is just so robust, so powerful. Um, you know, I, I really, I think we stand in a league of our own in terms of that collection, but we'll get to that. I, I think that that's, yeah. We'll save that for the demo. So let me, let me talk a little bit kind of about the state of things in security. Now, um, I'm going to ask all of you guys a question. Um, there's a lot of logos here. What do these, all of these companies have in common? Anything jump out? Anything that, you know, you could maybe put your finger on? Take a minute, just take a look. If there's any brands you don't know, I'm happy to, to you know. They've all had a data breach of some sort. Yep. <laughs> Wow, that was fast. <laughs> data loss. That was fast. And I, I will, yeah, I mean, I will say this is a, you know, there's public data that says that they've had a, a, a breach or an incident or something. And not just a breach or an incident. This has all happened within the last couple of months. So this is something that um, if we wanted to put all the year's stuff on one slide, I don't even think it would fit. Um, there's so many security incidents, so many breaches happening today. Um, it's it's worse than ever before. I, I've also talked to a lot of the cyber insurance folks that I stay in contact with. Cyber insurance is getting hit really hard just because there's so many breaches. And, you know, it's great that we're propping them up. Um, it's bad that it continues to happen. And so I think we need to think about the macro environments, figuring out what the, th the threats are, what the trends are, so that we can react as a security team and mitigate against them. And, and that's part of the challenge with security is security is not static. You have to evolve with the current threats. And a lot of those threats are actually related to human behavior. And that's something that's always been hard to model historically. So that's what we're going to get into. I want to spend some time on addressing the threats so you guys can think about how we're going to apply security to those threats. So I want to start with why. Um, 
every breach is is a little bit unique. Uh, some there's there's definitely trends uh, for certain ones, but everyone has you know a little bit of unique aspect to it. And what I want to talk about is kind of the three biggest reasons of why companies are getting breached. And this is my personal opinion. This is maybe not you know completely you know uh, static. And I'd love to hear your feedback if you disagree. The first reason I think is because technology footprint is dramatically expanding. Think about all of the cloud services and think about the subcategories within those cloud services. So AWS is a cloud service, but AWS has over 200 subservices within it and it's growing every day. And each one of those services has its own nuances with security, with access control, with data control, with encryption. And you're trying to manage this not just for AWS, but everything within AWS. And then multiply that by each different cloud provider that you may be in, Azure, GCP, Oracle, whatever it might be. Now you're basically expanding that footprint dramatically. Teams are adopting that because they're saying, hey, we're already approved for AWS. We're already approved for cloud or Google. Let's just go in and, and build some more stuff. And so as a security team, you're constantly trying to catch up. And it's hard because this is not this is not something that can be done manually anymore. This mm -hmm. needs technology. This needs automation in place to essentially keep up with that sprawl. Um, and that's you know, cloud is just one aspect. Imagine a lot of companies, and you know you need to imagine this, but mobile and mobile apps on your phones, right? A whole new surface area for attack that's always in your pocket. Devices, wearables, Apple Watch. I, I don't have one, but that's one that's very popular. Okay, Mike's got it for us. <laughs> um, IoT in general. Um, think about all of the tracking that needs to be done now in the retail space. Um, think about all of the cars that are on the road that now have IoT devices that are internet connected. Everything is expanding. And so that creates more surface area for attacks. And so I think that's one of the macro reasons why companies are getting breached is because of this dramatically expanding uh, surface area. The second reason is because, because <clears throat> excuse me, because of the the expanding surface area, it also means more vulnerability or more areas for vulnerability research. And so the way vulnerabilities come out is it's usually not because you know a company itself is finding them. Sometimes that happens, but a lot of the times it's because the research community and the security community band together or have groups or have units dedicated to doing security research. And so. They'll do a couple of you know security research projects. They might do some fuzzing. They might use some open source. Um, they might just be uh, you know I've reported bugs and vulnerabilities before, and it was just because I came across them uh, randomly while I was on you know sites or using products. I said, oh wow, this is a security vulnerability. I better report this. So a lot of that comes out organically, um, but there's only so many human researchers. We don't have a lot of automation. We don't have a lot of AI and security right now. Hopefully that changes. Um, and we're still seeing that vulnerabilities are basically growing year over year dramatically. And so on the left-hand side, this is just from CVE's reporting. Um, 2013, there was only 5,000 of CVEs for the whole year reported. And in 2022, there were 25,000. So 5x number of vulnerabilities reported um, out there. It doesn't mean that that's how many are, are actually exist. I actually think the number is, is much, much higher. but we're still getting a lot more reported. And so that supports the fact that vulnerabilities are increasing. Think about this. Have, has your security team increased 5X since 2013? Has your staff increased 5X since 2013? Well, there's five times more vulnerabilities out there. So what are we going to do? How are we going to catch up with that problem? And that's, that's something that I think a lot of companies are struggling with is everything's increasing really quickly. Vulnerabilities are increasing really quickly. And we don't necessarily have the resources to react quickly to everything that's coming out now. Um, for those who don't know, there's a lot of competitions around vulnerabilities. Um, Pawn to Own is a, one that just took place. Um, I think they, yeah, they awarded more multiple millions of dollars out uh, for basically it's a contest. Uh, you go out there, you hack things, and if you find a zero day, you get paid. That, that's the premise of it. And uh, they awarded a lot of oh, prizes for that, that contest. And then Zeridium is, um, if you don't know about this, it's a uh, it's an online broker website. You can go and Google it and read about it. 
but it's basically a um, a service that if you have a zero day and you know it's not reported, you could sell that for a certain amount of money, and it gets brokered into um, we don't know. It gets brokered into governments. It gets broken into private companies. Um, you can basically sell zero day exploits for money to Zerudium, and then they will facilitate that. And so that's another market um, that you know. People are are finding more vulnerabilities. Some report them, some don't, but it doesn't mean that they're going away. It means that it might just be pushed underground. So we're seeing a lot more surface area there. The last um, item I want to talk about is the tactics are evolving. And this is related to the threats that are coming out. Um, everyone's talking about ransomware, business email compromise. Those are still probably the top vectors today of just account takeovers and being able to access and deploy ransomware. But what you don't see maybe in all the headlines is how that's evolving. Um, I want to shout out to Microsoft for doing some really interesting research on Octotempest. Um, if you don't have, if you haven't seen it, or if you, if you want to catch up on Octotempest, I have a link here. But the basic premise of that is we're seeing groups get more sophisticated with their tactics that we haven't seen before. And so Back in the day, this particular group might have used uh, social engineering to get your, um, you know, two factor, or maybe did done some, you know, some basic stuff, uh, social engineering type stuff. Um, as that's evolved, now we've started seeing more collaboration with external parties. So you know, they used to be their own group. Now they're collaborating with other cybercrime units. Uh, they're layering on ransomware, for example, and they're layering on top of data breach. So they used to only um, go after data and kind of extort companies. Now they might be deploying ransomware with the help of uh, another group. They also might be extorting the company. So that, And then they also might be you know, trying to do a DDoS as a triple extortion technique. So you can kind of hit a company three different ways to get three different payouts, which is something that is, is concerning, especially as, as this is all of those can cost the business a lot of money. And so a lot of security folks and a lot of executives are thinking, how do I how do I mitigate this risk or how do I weigh this risk against paying a ransom versus not paying a ransom of, of all of these extortion techniques? Um, I will say Octotempest recently, um, there, there's some interesting threats where, you know, to get to factor, for example, they will make verbal or they will actually say, hey, listen, like real threats to your, your family or you know, basically SM, you know, SMS or your text threats to get you to give give your um you know your password or your multi factor authentication. So, um, you know, kind of kind of ruthless type attacks uh, that you know it is is something that we as security researchers like to see, so that we can mitigate or educate and and help inform our users that yeah. these types of things are happening. When you had actually told me about that when we were doing this, I was kind of taken by surprise because I was just thinking like the old school, you know, the guy diving into the dumpster like from the movie Hackers, trying to get the data that he wants, making like a few phone calls, and it's like, oh hey, I got what I want. But now that they're going to this level, like sending sending texts with what you had just said, you know, the the like one thing I see with this right is you know what if it gets to a, a kid and a kid tries to doesn't know what's happening. And then they go to their parent who may not know what's happening either. Like mm -hmm. it's just this domino effect of what could happen to it. It's it, it's rather horrifying. Yeah, exactly. And and this is something that we need to as companies, as security researchers need to understand and get in front of. And that's how it always been has been. It's like a cat and mouse game. Security uh, has always been that way. Uh, the last hack, the last bullet point I wanted to just touch on is we're also seeing higher disruptions internally at companies. So um, not being able to essentially respond quickly, not being able to respond and bring in external talent or do investigations quickly or have a long dwell time for folks that are uh, have essentially breached and stayed inside. And so all of this stuff combined shows that we're going, we're trending in the wrong direction. We're trending for more bad things to happen in the future. And I think as a security company that, that we're in, as well as the general audience, I think we're looking for ways to basically minimize all of these three areas to prevent companies from getting breached. Curious if, if this is new, or are you guys staying, like, is, is this on your... I think we're all pretty familiar with the, uh, uh, you know, kind of the state of uh, the union in terms of uh, data security and stuff like that. Many of us come from that space or or dabble in it. 
so I think we're all kind of eager to see where uh, the forward net- network solutions kind of stack mm-hmm. up against this or how to start to mitigate some of these threats. Uh, you know, what do you guys do? What do you guys do differently? Uh, how is your approach different? Uh, you know, just to, you know, to, to see how you guys are, are addressing, uh, you know, this, uh, this landscape. Okay, great. So let me um, let me dive into a couple of select breaches here um, because that will help lead into some of the stuff that we do to prevent it. And the idea is if you tie it to current threats, then you know that you're essentially spending money in the right place to help mitigate them. So first example, I want to just bring up uh, Move It. This is uh, a third party. So all of us have third party providers and they specialize in file services. And so the idea is they have a cloud version, they have an on-prem version. There was a massive vulnerability for this particular system and it was out there. It was on the internet, someone found an exploit for it and they started getting into all of these file servers and taking data. And this was real bad because there are a lot of sensitive documents in the Move It file system. This particular breach affected over 2,500 organizations, 66 individuals, millions so far. And we still, this is still evolving. This is still expanding. Um, And a couple of those logos that I mentioned before actually mentioned breach because of this. They were affected by this. Um, And so it is, third-party dependencies are something that is, are on everyone's mind. And so some of the ways that I think forward networks can help here is when we look at what the recommendation was from the vendor itself guess what they said they said you got to find all of these to find your instances and patch them but if you can't patch them directly at least turn off the exposure to it and so disabling the ports to the internet disabling of course internally basically isolating it was the number one remediation actually they didn't have a patch right away it came out later so that was one. And, and this is related to asset management. How do you know what servers you have? Can you find it quickly? Can you isolate it quickly? Um, there are some other recommendations as well uh, for RDP. So understanding quickly, what ports do I have open for RDP, even if it's internal or external? How do you isolate that, find it, turn it off quickly? And so this is something related to network security that will help when breaches like this happen. The next one is uh, is social engineering and MGM. So for those who don't know about the MGM attack, uh, there's a lot of research about it, a lot of open source. Uh, but basically the thread was they were able to attack the identity and access management platform, get long-term persistence, socially engineer folks so they could get in and move laterally, get administrative access, get passwords, pivot into VMware infrastructure, deploy ransomware, and then ultimately take data and ask for a ransom. And so there were a lot of steps to this, but there were also a lot of ways to help mitigate this attack as well. And one of them was network isolation, being able to essentially not move laterally quickly, being able to, if you're moving from one system as a user to another system as an admin, being able to log that, alert that, have an access approval request, that is, that's key for, for being able to help mitigate this. And then also understanding if there were something to happen, can you visualize your blast radius? So if a server was attacked and we know that this server is a top target, how can they move laterally? The last item is if someone's in and they're able to modify your network and modify your configs, are you able to restore a known good. Do you have backups for network devices? It's not something that's on everyone's radar. Everyone thinks of data backups, but how about config backups? That's really important. And being able to restore to known good will essentially save months, potentially years of rebuilding. Um, so that, that's another example here. Let me just go to the last example here uh, with regards to crypto mining. So this is something that uh, it's it's prevalent. It's It's essentially a lot of different breaches have happened for opportunistic attacks around crypto mining. And so the long story short is you might have folks that spin up Kubernetes, spin up dev environments, spin up test environments, and they accidentally expose a port that shouldn't be to the internet. There's basically a lot of people out there running scanners, being able to brute force, test default creds, break in within seconds, and then install backdoors or crypto miners. And this has caused a lot of headache for users being able to understand that, being able to remediate it quickly, 
Um, a lot of it doesn't cause business disruption. Some of it might be throttled, so you may not even know uh, unless maybe you get your bill and it's a little bit higher. Um, but there are ways to essentially look for this, identify this, and be alerted if new ports come up or if new devices come up. Um, also, being able to restrict access at the application layer is super important. Um, so understanding, even if you allow for SSH, do you have that visibility for user monitoring for SSH, for example? Will it go through a firewall rule and check it before it allows access? And, and one thing I just wanted to bring up with some recent news that came out um, with uh, Stripefly, this was a piece of malware that was really, really interesting to me because um, it was, for the most part, it looked like a crypto miner. It was a something that was lightweight, installed, ran in a Monero-type mining operation within an environment, and it was categorized as kind of basic malware. The funny thing is it actually didn't make very much money. They did some research and found out it was like on the order of maybe a couple million total. And it was it was a pretty large infection radius. And this got recently linked to using external blue as one of the exploit sources for moving laterally. And exploit uh, eternal blue was essentially the um, kind of that equation group type stuff that got leaked. And this in particular used eternal blue before that leak. Um, so uh, someone found that out and they said, oh, wow, this actually is not crypto mining uh, ransomware. This is actually nation state ransomware that's disguised as a crypto miner. And so sometimes malware is not what it seems on the on the outside. So it's something that even um, yeah, a lot of us are dealing with. We think that we have a handle on it, but this is a very dynamic environment and we learn stuff every day. So. Um, so one thing I just want to kind of round out here with uh, in terms of how I think about security and, and building successful programs for, for the larger audience here and, you know, small business, medium and large businesses, the way to do this, and, and this is in relation to all the threats that we're facing, the first is to have a very strong policy framework and executive support. And I don't need to tell any of you this. This is something that's super, super critical. But I think as small businesses start to stand up, um, and understand the security threats. Small businesses don't have a security person. They they generally might only have a, an IT person or, or someone who can just set up infrastructure and they might forego some of this. Um, but this is super critical to everything else that you're building internally and reacting to threats. If you have a policy that says, hey, we need MFA for everyone, that goes a long ways with protecting a company from these types of breaches that we just talked about. Um, so that that's, I think, the first one. The second bit of, uh, of, of my personal advice here is starting with what you know. So having essentially up-to-date inventories, labels, and ownership in your network is super key to responding to anything that comes up, anything new that comes up. Zero days, one days, advisories, new threats, exploitation, old threats that are, that are evolving into a new threat. You can't react to any of that unless you know your inventory and understand what you have. And that might be a software inventory, that might be a network inventory, might be a hardware inventory. There's just so much data there, uh, but it really starts with knowing your what you have. Uh, the third point is around keeping up with new vulnerabilities. Now, when you think about what do you do if a new vulnerability comes out? Um, guess what? You can't patch it. So what do you do? You have to think creatively. Um, you know, generally the default is if you have a vulnerability, you update, you patch it, but it's not always the case. And so you might have to add web application firewall rules. You might have to do network isolation. You might have to block ports. You might have to throttle traffic. Um, there's there's so many different ways that you might be able to respond and, and you can't respond if you don't know what it is. Um, so having that inventory is kind of related to the new vulnerability section. And then the last one is understanding essentially your playbook um, and are you doing, are you building a successful program? And part of that means having metrics in place, having analytics in place. How are we doing as a company? How are we deploying patches? How are we fixing things? Are we doing it quickly? Do we feel like we're prioritizing the right thing? And always referring back to that is, is how you grow uh, because you have to really understand, are we moving in the right direction versus just putting band-aids on everything? 